Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, you are live and direct from Lagos, Nigeria. I am with um, Sheyi, as um, promised. I, I, I recall, I think it was sometime late in January that um, one of the people who joined um, a Facebook uh, live streaming had asked for a topic um, relating to Bitcoin. So I sought out somebody I know who is a uh, keen cryptocurrency uh, person, who is, in, I mean, the person of shape. So she is here with me tonight, um, and I'll be asking him some questions. Please feel free to ask your own questions uh, or make comments as we go along, and I'm sure you'll find it extremely useful. Um, for a lot of people, Bitcoin is a mystery. You know, they don't know how it works, uh, whether it works, how safe it is, what, what should they do about it. But I believe Bitcoin is something that we have, we have, we have to live with. It's become a major thing now. So I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm going to be speaking with Shay and then trying to get some thoughts and insights from him. Being somebody who I know has followed it over a long period of time. So um, Shay, good evening. Good evening. I'm uh, sure for those who are in America, probably this is afternoon for you. Yeah, good evening, good morning. You know, for those who are in Australia. Australia, yeah. exactly. Good evening, everyone. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm happy to be here. And, uh, you know, hope we're going to have um, a you know, good discussion. Fantastic. Please, if you can hear me, if you can just type, I can hear you, just to be sure. Just to be sure. If you can hear us, just type, I, I can hear you. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Wumi. I mean, Fari, wow. That's interesting. Balogu, thanks for joining. Please, if you can hear us, just type, I can hear you, just to be sure that you can hear us. I'm waiting. If you can type, if you can hear me, just type, I can hear you. If you can hear me, just type, I can hear you. Right, anybody there? Can you hear me? Thanks, Julia, for joining. Okay, okay. I can see that somebody's liking it. Fantastic. Okay, so, um, Shay, I think, I mean, our viewers would like to meet you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is, my full name is Olushi Akindengi. Um, I work primarily as a cybersecurity consultant. Uh, however, I'm also um, a cryptocurrency and, uh, you know, Bitcoin, everything around cryptocurrency. I'm an enthusiast and, um, you know, it's, it's something I've been into for about two years or thereabout now. So that's basically, you know, um, brief introduction. I work as a cybersecurity consultant as well as, you know, being a cryptocurrency and blockchain. Fantastic. Um, I'm still trying to be sure that you can hear us. If you can hear us, can you please type in, I can hear you. If you can hear us, can you please type in, I can hear you. Okay, we're going to continue. I'm, I'm going to assume that you can hear us. So, Shay, what, what's what's Bitcoin, and I mean, uh, what's the relationship between Bitcoin and blockchain technology generally? Great, great question. Um, a lot of um, there's a, there's a lot of confusion around, you know, what Bitcoin or what you know the technology and blockchain is all about. Some people think it's, it's um, a Ponzi scheme. Some people think it's some you know multi-level marketing. It isn't. It's actually a new kind of currency or asset um let, let me put it that way it's a new kind of asset that is completely um you know decentralized uh it is distributed and it is secure and you know a lot of these things when you talk about it being decentralized it means it is um there is no single point of control for that currency so that means it's not you know issued by anyone distributed means there's no single point of failure that means that you cannot it cannot be hacked you know 
and it is secure because it uses the blockchain. Blockchain is just the infrastructure. And the way I can, you know, um, bring it down home is if you look at the internet, so look at the internet as the blockchain. Blockchain is the entire internet. And you know, on, on internet, you can pass a lot of things. So if you look at blockchain as the internet, Bitcoin is an application on that internet. So look at Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency as like an email. So just like you can have web browsing, you can have video call as we're doing now, you can have voice over IP, you can have email. So Bitcoin is just one application on uh, on the blockchain. So look at blockchain as the internet and then look at Bitcoin as like your email, the way you can send, you know, and receive email. So that's essentially what it is in a nutshell. Fantastic. So when, when, when was your first involvement with Bitcoin? Now, um, let me, I'll take you back, you know, a little story how I got involved in Bitcoin. It was actually by, um, by a little bit of accident. Um, you know, I told you at the beginning by introducing myself, I'm a cybersecurity consultant. So part of what we're doing, I mean, we, we are partners to, you know, the Apex Bank, Central Bank. So we do a lot of um, fraud investigation and cybersecurity for them. So there was a topic we were meant to present on about two years ago, which had to do with um, dark web. Now, if you know about the dark web, you know that the internet we're all using now is just about, you know, 2% of the entire internet. There's another 98% internet that we will never see, and that's the dark web, where you basically can buy anything from guns to drugs to, hack, you know, getting hired as a thing. So at that time, the central bank wanted to know, okay, if people were buying guns and buying, you know, drugs and, you know, doing all these dark market activities, how were they paying for those services? Obviously, they couldn't have been paying with our normal payment system, Visa, Mastercard, and all that. So it got us, you know, um, interested. It got us, you know, researching, and we found out that they were paying with cryptocurrency. And at that, at that time, it was Bitcoin, majorly they were using to pay. And you know, they just wanted us to know, okay, is they pay with, you know, because we are used to a traditional system of banking where you have your name, your account number, everything is already known. Okay, so how, you know, how really? Does the Bitcoin, how are they paying with it? How do they get it? So we got interested. So we got some Bitcoin for ourselves to try and simulate that activity to help us in our presentation to 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 um the, the bank. Sorry, just just to cut you. So what was the price per unit of Bitcoin as at that time? As at that time, Bitcoin was about hovering around four hundred to four fifty dollars. And how much is it now? Right now, Bitcoin is going for about eleven thousand dollars. Wow. So you can immediately think of Shay how much he has made. Well, anyway. it was even, you know, <laughs> just like I, I was, I was saying, okay. you know, we didn't even know that it was an instrument that was that volatile. To be honest, we we just thought, okay, this was like normal currency, like buying dollars. So it was actually we, then it was difficult to buy it from Nigeria. It was difficult to buy it from Nigeria here. So we had to um, send money to somebody, you know, you know, out of the country. I think it was in Canada at that time. It was a trust. You know, we had to pay naira into his account here. Then, you know, he sent us Bitcoin. And, um, you know, we tried to simulate activities on the dark web. So after that, you know, after that whole experience, two months later, I think we spent just a few Bitcoins and I think it was about zero point something then. Later, you know, we just got forgot about it. And two months later, uh, I just opened the wallet and I saw that the Bitcoin that was left, let's say I bought, um, say, $100 worth of Bitcoin at the time. Two months later, I saw that the $100 when I checked the wallet, it was reading, you know, something much higher. So I was like, ah, I remember that I bought a hundred dollars. So why is it reading, you know, something much higher? So it was then we started researching that, oh, it isn't really like a traditional currency whereby you have one pound today or one dollar today and your one dollar is one dollar in another two months or in another three months. This actually, so we now started tracing the price that, oh, even before it got to the four hundred dollars at that time, it was about three years prior, it was about, you know, 50 cents, very small amount. So we thought, oh, this, this may be an opportunity. And we started researching now, not the technical component again, we started researching the financial, and we saw that, oh, this was gaining traction, a lot more people were buying it, you know, so there was something to it. And then we just looked at it as, ah, well, this, this could be a way to actually store, you know, your normal, you know, cash. And it was on the blockchain. It was very easy to verify. It was peer to peer. Now, um, the peer to peer nature of it is what actually you know stands it out. Peer to peer meaning that it operates exactly like your physical cash, your pound, your dollar, your naira. The way you give somebody one naira. If I give the person ten naira, for instance, 
left my hand, it's gone to him. I don't need any bank to settle that. I don't need any, you know, it's trust. I give it to him, no claim, no settlement. That's essentially what Bitcoin is. And we thought, oh, this was a fantastic, you know, invention. We got reading the white paper and we actually now said, well, I think it's something that we could go full time into. So that was, that was our foray into, especially my foray into understanding the whole cryptocurrency thing. And, and, and I must say, I mean, one, one of the reasons why I, I thought she was probably one of the best people to approach was because at the same time on Facebook, you had posted something about Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, something to watch out for, you know, and so to see it progress the way it has progressed, you know, I, I, I find that uh, very interesting. I, I am not very, very um, risk prone, you know, so, and um, being a financial person, one of the things we say is, if you don't understand it, you shouldn't invest in it. So, so what we say is, if you cannot explain it to a seven-year-old, you have no business in investing in it. And people have asked me about Bitcoin. I just tell them, you know what, they're people who know better than me. And so I am also learning, just like you're learning, so that we don't um, um, kind of allow the opportunities that are available with Bitcoin, so to speak, pass us by. So I'm going to ask um, Shay, um, why should anybody bother about Bitcoin? I mean, I know you're set part of it, but why, why, why? Is it something? Is it a passing trend, or is it a fade, or, or what? Or why, why should anybody bother about it? Uh, you know, um, there is um, the, the way I can put it is um, I, I'll take you back again to a bit around about 1998, 1999, 2000, when we had the advent of the internet. You know, this was something that we were not used to. Then, if you wanted to buy something, you had to go physically into a supermarket or wherever and you make payments and you bring home physical goods. And I remember at the time too, I told people that, look, this internet was going to change a lot of stuff. I mean, you could sit in your house, order for stuff, you know, online, and then get it delivered without leaving your house. It sounded like magic. It sounded like something that we could not envision because at the time, we were used to a certain mode of working. Even then, I remember very well in my, my final year in, in University of Lagos, um, I had a presentation with some professors and uh, what, what, what I told them was that uh, um, the school system that we have now, people would attend school, the books we read will be electronic, we will not have physical books again, we will not have papers again, we will be reading online, and people will be attending. But it sounded very fictitious and very futuristic. And it was all because of the advent of the internet. Now, if I bring it down to the same um, Bitcoin, I think a lot more people should be involved in it because we are at the beginning of this technology. Yes, there's a lot of misconception, there's a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of people are thinking this is not something we're used to. I mean, if you want to spend your money, you're used to your cash, why would I, you know, invest in something like Bitcoin? But I say for people that are, that are, you know, young, that are, you know, um, you know, I'm not saying you should put all your eggs in one basket or put all your, you know, if you can afford just a little bit of it, just, you know, um, just to try it out and see how it works. I think it is the future of financial systems it is the future of financial technology um as, as we know it now very soon we're going to have you know um uh, bitcoin is going to change the way traditional finance is done it's going to change the way traditional banking is done so i think that's the reason why a lot of people should be looking at it it's a bit like people who started with amazon google back in the day and we didn't understand what was this whole e-commerce thing you know how, how what you know and a lot of people that got started got a head start all of them, I mean, uh, are becoming, you know, financially successful. So if you look at the very rich list, a lot of the rich people are technology people. They are not financial people. Bill Gates is a technology person. Jeff Bezos is a technology person. So they were people that saw that technology was going to change the future. The same way people are now saying that blockchain and cryptocurrencies will, you know, eventually change the future. So I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, a lot of people should at least be paying attention to it. It's interesting you highlighted the fact that the guys who are actually leading the rich list are people who are taking advantage and also I mean leading the technology. So somebody Tai was asking, Tai will thanks for joining. Um sorry, I probably can't mention everybody. Um they've been talking about Fashino, Toy, Shoga Olu, Toy, I mean Alonga all the way from the state, Bayo Awolari, Pastor Bayo from Canada, Taiwo Ipadiola, thank you very much. Leo Goke, everybody, thank you. Taiwo is asking, um, can cryptocurrency only be bought on the dark web? Um, you see, the advent of anything, anything that is new, you see, the people that, that understand all these technologies first are people that are that do cheap stuff. 
that it was a big figure on board. Just like when the internet came, the people that got on board the internet at the time were pornographic sites, were people that were doing shady deals. So at the time, it was that was why it was almost shut down. Like why, why? So that means if I connected the internet, I have free access to you know all these bad sites. Now, so at the time when Bitcoin was going to come up, the people that embraced it were people that were shady. Were people that were on the dark web, were people that wanted to sell drugs, and they knew that. I mean, if you wanted to sell drugs and you didn't want the um, authorities coming to trace you, you would use Bitcoin because of its, um, on, on, well, anonymous nature. Not really anonymous, but, you know. So they got on board, and it then made it a bit popular because people were now using it. And of course, in any institution, just like with cash, cash is when you want to do anything right now, you use cash. You don't use checks, you don't use, because you don't want to be traced. Nobody can trace. You know the origins of, of of cash so it cannot right at the at, at, at about 2010 2011 yes it was only on the dark web you could use it but right now it has gone mainstream i mean just pick up any financial newspaper you see stuff on cryptocurrency switch on any financial news you know international financial news in fact right now it's gotten so mainstream that you the the the, the, the um, cbo he does in chicago board of, of options and Exchange as well as the CME, Chicago Mercantile. Those are the those are the like the regulatory bodies for alternative assets in in the US. They're taking it on board and they started you know um, using it as um, a financial instrument. So I think right now it's not just about that word. It's something that's gone mainstream. I mean, if you go to Microsoft, you can pay stuff with Bitcoin. If you go to you know Overstock.com, you can actually buy a laptop. You can buy anything you want on on on, 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 on the internet. With Bitcoin. And then the good thing about with, with um, cryptocurrency. I don't want to use just Bitcoin because there are a lot of other cryptocurrencies, you know. But Bitcoin is just like you know um, the so main it. one, exactly. So right now you can. I mean, th there is no um, Bitcoin doesn't care if you're tall, short, you're in, in Nigeria or Congo or you're in the US. You, they cannot block you. Just like with PayPal, they can cut you off because it's centralized. But with Bitcoin, you can use it anywhere as long as you know you are connected to the internet. It is, it is, it is all well and good. I think you know, that's one of the advantages. Yeah. And Antonia Longa is saying something very important. She's saying that the, the price per unit, so to speak, of Bitcoin today is almost eleven thousand dollars, which is hardly affordable. So, how do you get involved in Bitcoin when the price per unit is almost eleven? Um, and I'll tell you this. That's why the rich people continue to be richer. Um, with the same Bitcoin that is almost eleven thousand dollars today, as at this time last year, if we had been doing this interview. Um, in um, 20, this time last year, Bitcoin was going for like one thousand, you know, one hundred dollars. So right now, that means between last year and this year, just three hundred and fifty-five days, we've had a ten x multiple. So if you had bought one Bitcoin last year, you'd be sitting on a ten x multiple now. A year before, two years ago, it was less than you know five hundred dollars. So you can see the the, the the, the, the price movement. So people that saw the vision, people that saw that this thing was going to go mainstream, they started accumulating. Now, if you want to get involved, you don't have to buy one full Bitcoin. I was going to ask yeah. Kelly that. Must you buy okay, one full Bitcoin? You don't have to buy it. Now, look at Bitcoin as a digital version of gold. Just like you don't go to the market and say you want to buy one ounce of gold. You can actually buy, you know, break them down into grams. So Bitcoin is divisible into 100 million units. So you want Bitcoin can hundred million units. Yes. Okay. Just like with your dollars, pounds, cents, naira, yeah. and naira can be divided into hundred units. That's one cup, you know, into couple hundred units. But Bitcoin can be divided into hundred million units. So that means you can buy zero point zero 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 one Bitcoin. So you now divide that price. So if you want to buy say zero point zero five or zero point zero zero one. Just divide the 10,000 by 0 0.01 and you probably get $100. So it means you can buy $100 worth of Bitcoin. You can buy $200 worth of Bitcoin. You can buy $50 worth of Bitcoin. You can buy $10 worth of Bitcoin. So you're not limited by, you know, uh, the amount of um, uh, Bitcoin you can, you can accumulate. Okay. I mean, that, that's very helpful, actually, because many a times we just see it as one solid block. But I think the example of gold that you gave is yeah. so, so important. You don't go and buy a bullion of gold, yeah. so to speak. You can buy it in grams or in whatever pounds or however it's measured. Now, Taiwan is asking again, there's a lot of fraudulent sites. I think you've mentioned that. I mean, I'm talking about the dark web, selling Bitcoin. Major UK financial service organizations have disallowed the purchase of Bitcoin via mainstream bank accounts. I mean, what, what do you have to say? Now, to what they've disallowed from what I get is 
using your credit card to buy. They don't want yeah, people going into debt that, yeah. to buy a speculative instrument. So let's be honest, it is a speculative instrument at this point in time. It is, you know, that's why the price is very volatile. Today you see it now, it's almost eleven thousand dollars. You wake up tomorrow, it could be fifteen thousand dollars. Just the same way it could be ten, you know, it could go to eight thousand dollars. So it's very speculative. So what they are trying to do, especially for people that don't understand it, you don't want to buy something today and you wake up and then it's gone down. Okay, so that's why they're trying to say, look, if you want to buy, you can use your debit card, but credit card isn't allowed because you have to pay, you know, you have to pay back, you know, that. So they don't want people using their credit card to buy. You can use your, I mean, there are exchanges. I know there's so many exchanges in the world, Bitstamp, Coinbase in the US, where you decide with your, with your account, and then you can you can pay directly from, you know, money in your account. But they have not stopped, you know, uh, what they're talking about is regulation uh, at the moment, and, um, you know, you can buy Bitcoin on any exchange. On You can even look out Bitcoin, which is a peer-to-peer -peer exchange uh, to get your Bitcoin. Nobody has stopped it, but what they have stopped is the use of credit card to buy your know, Bitcoin. Wow. Lois, thanks for joining. Um, okay, so I think I think it's important. I, I need to emphasize that too. Uh, and fortunately, there's a regulation in the UK that you can't use your credit card to purchase Bitcoin. I think it only makes sense. Like Shea has said, you don't want to begin to go into debt in trying to buy speculative instruments. Um, so, um, so how can you buy Bitcoin? Good. Um, there are a lot of ways you can buy Bitcoin. Uh, right now, the easiest way is to open an account on an exchange. In um, If you're within Africa here, yeah, there are all sorts of exchanges. There's Luno, there is... Um, so, but how, how do you know the, the, the on, I mean, a, a genuine exchange? Or, or are they listed anywhere? Or uh, well, the thing is, just like, um, you know, it, it, it's new, but there are not... Around this part, there aren't too many. Um, there aren't too many, to be honest. Uh, but the few ones that exist are, you know, well known. You know, they're, they're really well known. There is Naira X, you know, which I used to buy from at the beginning. They have, they all have websites, and they all have. You can just go on Google and just, you know, research. You know, uh, just buy on known exchanges. You know, then of course, um, if you're really paranoid, there's a website called localbitcoin.com. Localbitcoin.com. Yeah. Okay. So what? That local Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer market. So if you want to buy Bitcoin, you can actually um, go on local Bitcoin. You see all the people that are trading, buying and selling, and they are it's peer to peer. So you can you know chat 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 with them. They have their own bank account. You can give them, and then they have a some kind of escrow system whereby if you you don't pay directly to the merchant, you only pay to him. It goes into escrow. Once it delivers the Bitcoin to you, you just click a button. And they release the funds to him. If he does never deliver, then you get your funds back. So that's that's you know uh, for for starters, you can you can you can use that. You can use exchanges. Exchanges are run by you know you can use any exchange in the world. Like you know, there's so many of them. If you go to Bitcoin.org, you know there's a website called Bitcoin.org. They list all under the exchanges. You list all the all the you know well-known exchanges um, on, on that site, and you can buy from from any one of them. In US, the major one is actually Coinbase. There's Gemini, you know, in Europe you have you have big stamp, you have cracking, there are all sorts of you know exchanges that are that you can get you can give Bitcoin from. Okay. And um Jide Abraham, thanks for joining. Um Jide is saying I disagree that Bitcoin will become a major means of exchange. Bitcoin is held as an anonymous on an anonymous basis, I think you mean, and it's free from government regulations and control. This also makes it a very good tool for criminals. A recent study found that 55% of transactions using Bitcoin are to do with illegal activities such as malware, ransom, drugs. I think you've already addressed that at the beginning. Did you have any other things to just Now, let that? me, uh, you see, the truth is, um, I, I understand the concern. I mean, even this concern is shown by quite a number of people. Anytime you have something that is new and drastic and, and that changes the way we think, it's going to elicit that kind of fear. When the internet first came as well, I remember, you know, the... Um, the minister even in Nigeria, they wanted to stop it. I mean, if you're giving, normally we're used to watching TV, TV comes on at 12 o'clock and it goes on. Now you're saying anybody can go onto the website and go anywhere they want and interact with any, even when social media came up, this Facebook we're using today to disseminate this information. A lot of people were using it for, you know, drug dealing, they were using it for negative, but because you can, you see, the truth is, the tool is not the problem. It is the person, which is why, I mean, even if you, 
if you be reading about the gun laws in America, they will tell you that guns don't kill people, people that kill people. So at the end of the day, it is not the truth, it's not the Bitcoin. Whether Bitcoin exists or not, there will be drug dealers. Whether it exists or not, there will be fraud stars. Whether it exists or not, I mean, Bitcoin is new. Bitcoin just came up about eight years ago. Um, no, nine years ago now. And before that, we've had drug dealing, we've had money laundering, we've had so many. And what were they using? They were using cash. So you say because we're using cash, cash is now not, you know, are you going to, are you going to ban it? So it's just a tool, it's just a channel, it's just a medium. People still commit fraud with credit cards, people commit fraud with debit cards, they commit fraud with PayPal. So you can't stop that innovation because of the you know pockets of people that will use it in a negative way. What we can do is, of course, regulate how it is being used. So if, for instance, if someone wants to buy uh, for money laundry, for instance, I mean there are regulations around the amounts you can buy. So if someone just comes and says I want to buy, you know, a um, hundred million dollars worth of of Bitcoin, why right? do you need a hundred million dollars of Bitcoin at once? So that's the regulation. So you have to regulate those exchanges, people buying and selling it. That's the only way to get it, you know, mainstream. And as to whether it will change the financial landscape, it probably may not change it, but it's going to be an added to look at how if internet has changed, you know, dissemination of information. Right now, we can actually host this program today. Back in the day, you probably have had to go to a TV station. You know, to you know, get approval and all that. Right now, with the internet, you know, just launch your Facebook Live and you are on there and you are transmitting to the entire world. You go on YouTube, the same thing. You don't. Has it changed the financial? Um, I mean, has it changed the information media? You still have the TV, you still have CNN, you still have all that. But this is another channel. While we are talking about financial, you know, empowerment today, some people are probably using it to talk about you know drugs and fraud. And you know all sorts of things. Are you going to blame Facebook for that? No, you're not going to blame Facebook for that. So that's our take on cryptocurrency. It is not going to change. There will still be banks. There will still be PayPal. There will still be Mastercard. There will still be Visa. However, for people, remember there are seven billion people in the world. And out of that seven billion people, about three point five billion of them have no access to financial, you know, um, uh, instrument. This has given them a leeway into having. You know that kind of thing, and we think it can only you know add to what we currently have, not subtract, uh, subtract from it. That's that's very interesting. Um, I mean, like you said at the beginning, Bitcoin is only one part of one form of cryptocurrency, but because it's the major one, that's why we're talking about Bitcoin. Maybe with time, we probably mention some other uh, mainstream ones if there's anything like that. But Taiwo is saying, looking forward to the future, there is a likelihood that someone will create another variant of cryptocurrency. Cobra coin. Are there any strategies you can share on how this will impact the market? Great. Um, you see, some people will even say, is there any strategy on how I can create my own Bitcoin, my own cryptocurrency? Oh, absolutely. I uh -huh. mean, there are, you see, a lot of people, virtual currencies are made up of two distinct currencies. There's cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, Litecoin, Dash, you know, all those mainstream ones. Then there is digital currency. Now, in talking about it, you have to understand that there are two types of assets. There are assets that have intrinsic values. You know, there are assets that have intrinsic values. And then there are assets that are backed by something else. I'll give you an example of assets that have intrinsic value. An asset that has an intrinsic value is something like perhaps um, this laptop or this computer that we're using to broadcast to you. The value is without it, you know. So the value is in, in it, in what I'm able to do with it. Now, but there are assets that are backed by something else. So if, uh, you know, uh, these are fair currencies used to be backed by gold back in the day. So if you actually had a, a $1 bill, that $1 bill was backed by, you know, a certain amount of gold that was stored in the, the bank vault somewhere. That's an example of an intrinsic asset. So when people talk about creating their own digital currencies or copper coin or Nara coin, it is very possible, whereby a central bank of a country, for instance, can actually launch their own currency on the blockchain. So we can have the US dollar on the blockchain that is backed, backed by the US dollar in the bank. So if you go to your bank, for instance, and you have 1,000 US dollars in the bank, they can issue you 1,000 US dollars in cryptocurrency that you store in your wallet. And every time you transact with it, you know, it is backed by what you have you know, so that's what we call. So you can actually have something like copper coin, and it is only going to enhance, you know, um, the financial system 
that we currently have now. It's not going to take away from it. So really, it's, it's improvement all the way. And again, let me talk about things like um, infrastructure inversion. When the internet first came, it was only pure. We only had pure data. We could not have done this. You know, it, over over time, we started having you know voice. Then after that, people realized, oh, if we can carry voice, let's try video. If we can carry video, let's try movies. You know, so over time, things are going to start changing. Social media was not wasn't big back in the day. Now, social media is huge. You know, we have Instagram, we have Facebook, we have Snapchat. You know, a lot of these things are the result of innovation. So once the platform is there, so never mind what is happening now with cryptocurrencies. We're still in the very, very early stages. In fact, if you've been going online, there is um, there are speculations where there are these speculations that by this time next year, we probably are having this. Maybe one Bitcoin will probably be a hundred thousand dollars. We never just know. So it's that it's we're not saying you should put every you know, all your eggs in one basket or go and convert all your money to Bitcoin. But it's something you should be looking at if you can, you know, if I tell people, if you can afford one Bitcoin, maybe over time, over a period of a year, you can buy 0 0.1 today, 0 0.05 tomorrow or next tomorrow or whatever. Accumulate up to one Bitcoin and keep it somewhere and forget it. Come back in five years' time. The worst that can happen is you lose, you know, the cost of a Bitcoin now, which is $10,000, which isn't, you know, exactly life changing, you know. You lose that, but the upside is that your ten thousand dollars can be. I mean, people bought Bitcoin. I mean, they they're big. If you look at Forbes, Forbes now have a list of um, cryptocurrency, you know, um, rich list, and you can see that the people that bought there's, there's some people bought two hundred thousand Bitcoin when it was like two cents. Now two hundred thousand Bitcoin multiply that by eleven thousand. They are most they are billionaires in dollars, you know, because they were able to, you know, um, they were able to jump on that on that chain. You know um, when it came out so it's a it's, it's a strategy it's um yes it's highly risky it's highly speculative but it's something that over a long period of time and if you've been following technology the way it is especially the blockchain technology that powers it you know, can you can't you can't possibly go wrong good um thanks Taiwo. that was um, really contributive it says the uniqueness of blockchain is that it takes away the requisite for a global ledger which is the backbone of all financial services uh, by the way, Taiwo is a bank, is a investment. Uh, I mean, she operates in the investment banking world. This creates the opportunity to transact on the scale of the internet. The internet of all things also removes the opportunity to monitor transactions fairly from a geographical perspective. I guess that's the comment. So, but now it's one thing to buy Bitcoin. Can you sell Bitcoin? Of course, you can sell Bitcoin. As you, I mean, every time you buy from someone, someone is selling to you. So that's why we have exchanges. The traditional function of an exchange is I have something like your stock exchange, for instance. If you have stocks today, you want to sell, you go to the floor, they match the buyer with the seller, and then you know you come together. That's the function of an exchange. So if you have Bitcoin, you can sell it on exchange, you can you know sell it on local Bitcoin, you can have, there are all sorts of I mean, this is a whole new movement, it's a whole new asset class, it's a whole new, you know, and you see the truth is the Older generation of people, people that are probably around 50 and above, they are struggling to understand just the same way they did not understand. That's why most people on social media, there a lot of them are the demographics of people on social media are probably between the ages of maybe 13 and probably like 49 or thereabout. Anybody above the because they grew up in a in, in, in a setting where I mean if you wanted to see a friend, you would leave your house, drive your car, or go, go and see the person. Right now, you want to know if the person is at home, you use WhatsApp, are you around? You can't you don't even have to leave your house. So it has changed a lot of, 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 of it's changed a lot of um uh the way we live. So the same thing with the cryptocurrency. So it is a, there's a lot of market for I mean cryptocurrency. The, the the reason why the price is going up, I mean you should ask yourself why why was Bitcoin one thousand dollars last year and three sixty five days later said almost eleven thousand dollars. Actually at some said you almost inked twenty thousand. In fact, yeah. Why? Because people were buying. I see it is the most, um, economics will tell you that leave everything to the law of supply and demand. It, is, it works on the basis of supply and demand. If there are more buyers than sellers, what you have, the price is going to go up. If there are more sellers than buyers. Now, at the time, he just mentioned something about eating $20,000. Now, if you look at when he hit $20,000, um, it was at the time around November, December. 
Now, when people buy at twenty thousand dollars, and then you now need to sell at around Christmas to get you know cash to do your Christmas shopping and New Year shopping, you actually have to convert it to you know because there are still too many places in the physical world that take Bitcoin. So when there are more sellers than buyers, the price will automatically fall. So that's why you know the price will keep. So every time you see the price rising, just know that there are more buyers than sellers. And when the price keeps falling, there are more sellers than you know. And I always tell people every time the price you know goes down, that's the best opportunity to buy. Every time it, I mean, just early this year, just early this year, it got down to six thousand dollars, you know, and a lot of people bought. So if you have bought even around about January of this year, six thousand dollars, now it's almost eleven thousand. You are almost making a hundred percent within a short period of time, and that's what has led to another industry called trading. There are people that trade. On a daily basis, we we'll watch the price movement. Just like somebody puts 10,890 now, some guy will go in there and buy probably two bitcoins at 10,890. Maybe by tomorrow morning, gets to like 11,500. He sells. So within overnight, he's made about 700, 800 dollars on one bitcoin. That's about 1,600 dollars. He cashes in. He waits for the price to drop again. He buys. He sells when he goes. So it's a lot of. I mean, a lot of people are really making a lot of money in this. Um, in this. In this. In this. And and and, and, and it's easy to make. You know that money you get dedicated to it. Fantastic. I mean, I think one of the things that has stuck with me from what you've said um, is the fact that you shouldn't be kind of overwhelmed by the price of one bitcoin. You know, think of it like you said as, as gold. You know, which can be bought at, at different weights. You know, so but what what should be of interest to you should be the returns on whatever you buy. So if you buy, if you bought zero point one. And it's 0 0.2 tomorrow, at least you know you are getting double value for your investment rather than seeing it as having to buy $10,000. So if you buy $2,000 or $1,000 or $100 worth, and what you have gotten is $200, then you have not done bad. Um, Toy said, um, I just got, I mean, she posted some things, if, if you're online, about Bitcoin, um, 10000 something, Bitcoin cash. So she's asking, I just got that from Bit, uh, from Coinbase. What's the difference between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash? Okay, great, great question. Um, unfortunately, this kind of question is, is going to be is technical in nature, but I'll try and break it down for you. Now, um, you see, Bitcoin was the main currency for a long time. And for because it is decentralized now, unlike with dollars, if anything, I got a, an email from my bank today that they were withdrawing the old 10 pounds from you know the system. So everybody has to go in and it is regulated by a central body. So the control, everything about the pound, everything about the dollar is regulated by the Federal Reserve of America US. For the pound, it is the Bank of England. Now, but with Bitcoin, there is no Bitcoin Federal Reserve Bank. So the decision around everything, remember that Bitcoin, it's it's called cryptocurrency for a reason. Everybody talks about the currency base. They don't talk about the crypto base. The crypto base is the technology base. It powers by it, it, the technology powers it. Now people have to make decisions around that technology. Now, if there is no consensus around how that technology so to be done, they are not going to move forward. So if people think, oh, we need to increase now, Bitcoin has a block size. Bitcoin works on the blockchain. That block part of it is the block size. It's a bit like uh, say in your office, for instance, um, you're currently using one meg per second to the internet. Now, if, I mean, it takes only one person to say, well, let's move to two meg, which is the MD. Now, imagine if your office has no MD. It's just, if there's no MD, there's no CEO, everybody's on the same level, and everybody has to contribute. Now, they now have to go through voting. Do you want us to upgrade to two meg? You have to put it through voting. And if you don't meet that, probably 60, 70% consensus, it will not happen. And that's exactly what happened with Bitcoin. Some people wanted the block size to increase. You know, that block size is the amount of transaction each block can take. Just like with your one meg bandwidth, you can download. It's going to take you, if you want to download 50 meg file, it will take you 50 minutes because it's uh, 50 seconds because it's one meg per second. Now, somebody will now say, why can't we get 50 meg per second? Now, if you get 50 meg per second, yes, you download that 50 meg in one second. But how about the cost of that 15 meg per second. So some people say, well, let's continue with our one meg and pay this at small amount. But some people will say, oh, if we can get 15 meg for this amount, why don't we increase, you know? So there is some kind of dichotomy, and which was what led to when they couldn't reach that consensus of the block size of the original Bitcoin, the Bitcoin cash now said, look, let's increase the block size. 
to four men or eight men as the case may be and then they now split the original bitcoin to the bitcoin it's a bit like um why do we have facebook twitter instagram snapchat somebody looked at facebook which, which was the original social media and said, facebook is too bulky you know is there too many things around why don't i have one that's just for purely pictures and he started you know instagram another person said why don't i have one that's just for purely text twitter so it now depends so we now right now we have facebook we have twitter we have you know instagram we have snapchat we have all sorts of social media doing all sorts of things and they are all competing within the same space so if you like you use facebook if you like you use twitter if you like you and if you like you use all of them so all of them bitcoin cash bitcoin ethereum are all cryptocurrencies doing virtually you know you know different things so that's the way i can explain Fantastic. Fantastic. I, I, I believe that we are learning, learning so much here. Um, I think, Alice, you've given us some reasons why, to a large extent, we can trust that Bitcoin has not come to just like, go away. Fun. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely going to influence much more in the future. Um, you've talked also about who is in charge of Bitcoin. There's no central uh, point, per se. Um, so you've mentioned wallet about twice now. So what's a Bitcoin wallet? A Bitcoin wallet, the way I can explain it to you know people out there is your if you use a mobile app, mobile banking app, say your bank has given you a mobile app. Now, you see the truth of the matter is that every time you use your mobile app and you log in and you check your account balance, say your account balance is a thousand pounds. Now, that thousand pounds that you are seeing on that screen, do you think it is physically sitting in the vault of your bank? No, it's just a physical. It is at the point where you want to say interact with. They're just those that you're seeing. It's not held anywhere. Okay? When you go to an ATM and you, you know you, you see that your balance, it is not held anywhere. Now, that is that bank's wallet. It's an interface to your money. Now, with a Bitcoin wallet, Bitcoin actually is like the real physical wallet that you have in your pocket. The real physical wallet you have in your pocket actually has what? Your cash. So when you put your 1,000, you know, pound or 100 pound bill in it you can take it out it is there it is resident there it is physical it's something you can see that's essentially what the bitcoin wallet does online so when you store your bitcoin um in that wallet it is actually there. it is not stored you know in a random there's no bitcoin bank it is there it is in your control which is why bitcoin operates on public private key which is the crypto why that's why it's called a cryptocurrency or like with your bank that you have an account number you have a zero 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 one two three that's your account number for that particular bank with bitcoin you have a wallet address so anybody that wants a wallet address is like your facebook address it's like your twitter address that somebody can if it's go on like with the twitter address or a facebook address this is governed by cryptography mathematics and that's why that there's an entire science behind which is why i always tell people you see, don't invest. He said something at the beginning. Don't invest in something you don't understand. There's a technology that it's just like saying the internet. You wake up tomorrow and there will be no internet. It is not possible because the technology gets. Even if they pull unplug the internet from Nigeria to somebody, as long as two computers can com communicate with themselves, you have a mini, you know, internet. The same thing with cryptocurrency. The technology is there. They are only going to, you know, improve upon that technology uh, as well. So that wallet is what stores your so you have the ethereum wallet you have a bitcoin wallet you have your bitcoin cash wallet some wallets can store multiple cryptocurrencies some wallets can store only one cryptocurrency some wallets can you know it, it depends on what you want to do so that wallet is like your interface to using the um, that particular cryptocurrency okay, that's fantastic i mean austin i guess because it's just joined the saying it's also very risky which you've addressed and i think all investments carry out i mean carry their own risk so it depends on what kind of um, risk putting, appetite putting your you money have. in the bank is risky yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah let me just tell you how you, the reason why the invention of bitcoin came about was around 2008 when there was the financial crisis i mean people went to their banks especially even in greece you go to your bank and they will tell you that your money i mean you, you, you slept yesterday with a thousand pounds in your account and you're waking up today and the bank is saying well we're sorry you cannot collect more than 100 pounds you know there was a global financial crisis and someone else thought about it that do we have to entrust you work you know you come to this world you work 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 and then you entrust your money to a bank and then at the end of the bank day the bank is telling you that well we are sorry we can't give you your money that 
you know, we had that financial crisis and banks had to be bailed out. Then they came up with that invention of, you know, peer-to-peer, -peer, which is why the coin paper is called the peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. It is cash, but electronic. What we have now is is electronic um, is the electronic money is, is, is a messaging system when I open my bank and I send um, a thousand pounds to somebody in another bank what I'm just doing is I'm sending a message to my bank to please take money from my account and credit this person but with cryptocurrency I'm actually in control of that process the same way I give somebody a 1000 naira bill and I'm actually is leaving my pocket physically and transferring to that person I'm in full control of it you just want to talk uh, just a bit about Bitcoin mining. Now, Bitcoin mining is a, the entire process of governing or securing that Bitcoin infrastructure. Remember that we said that Bitcoin does not have a Bitcoin central bank. There's no Bitcoin bank. There's no owner of Bitcoin, just like there's no owner of the internet. But somehow, you have to give the people that are doing the transaction. So when I send Bitcoin from one person to the other, when I send Bitcoin from one person to the other, what I am actually doing is I am leveraging on the blockchain infrastructure. Now, blockchain is, the way I can put it is um, the, like your, it, it, there are computers that are securing you know, those transactions, making sure that nobody is cheating. Just like with your bank, every time you, do a, you, you perform a transaction with your bank, they have a ledger. So you debit one account, you credit another well, that is centralized. It is run by your bank. Somebody within your bank can go and change the ledger. So if you transfer, that's why there is a lot of fraud in the system. So if I transfer 100 pounds and some administrator in the bank wants to commit fraud, what if he changes the 100 pounds to 1,000? You know, at the back end, you remember that he has access to it. So with Bitcoin, that ledger is maintained by those miners. And those miners have to be in consensus. I mean, those miners are like individual, you know, security guards for the blockchain network. So if someone wants to change the system, all the miners have to be in consensus. So if somebody changes it, if it is not changed on minor B and minus, and remember that those miners are spread across the world, you know, it will not it will not be accepted into the ledger. So the only thing that will be accepted into the ledger is what they see and what is what is in kind of consensus. That's why they call them mining. Mining is another way, is another form of saying they are securing that ledger infrastructure to make it secure, to make it and then as part of what they give the miners, they incentivize them for doing all that work. Since there's no Bitcoin bank. Who pays their salary? They pay them with Bitcoin. So those small transaction fees that you actually see when you do, um, I don't know how many people have conducted a, a cryptocurrency or Bitcoin transaction, those small transaction fees actually go to the miners as incentives. I mean, because they actually use electricity, they use the internet, so they will be able to pay for their internet and all that. That's, you know, that's how they get paid. That's why they, they have an incentive mechanism to actually even secure that Bitcoin network, which is why it's a perfect network. It's never been hacked. You know, it has never been hacked. It's 100%, you know, secure. That's why we think the technology is here to stay. Wow, very interesting. I almost, I'm almost becoming a Bitcoin convert if I have not become one already. Right? Especially knowing that I don't have to buy one Bitcoin. I can buy in smaller denominations, just like you can get a dollar, uh, even cents, or a quarter, yeah, you, or, get, yeah. you know, and, and, and things like that. Fantastic. Um, Jimmy, I think you probably have answered this already. Jimmy is asking, what of one coin and what is the difference between Bitcoin and one coin? Are both operating the same way? No. Um, you have, we have to be careful. Anything that is new, a lot of people are going to try. And now, one coin and all these, in my own opinion, uh, and of course, you can also do your own research, they are all Ponzi schemes. Now, the, the, if it does not have a blockchain behind it, that's it, what one coin doesn't have a blockchain. Exactly. And when we say it has a blockchain, it has to be a global distributed ledger. That means that I can, any from anywhere in the world, I can key in, you know, something. They must have a blockchain and I can see the transaction. If it does not have a blockchain, it is, um, it is centralized. It is Ponzi. Now, with Bitcoin, you don't have to sign up members. You don't have, it's, it's like buying gold. When, you, when I buy gold, I don't have to tell the next man to buy two ounces for me to earn another ounce. No, I just buy it and I hold, you know, and I keep it, you know, maybe for my daughter or something. I don't have to, there's no mechanism. It's my property. If you buy, the same thing with land. If I buy land, land will increase in value over time. 
I don't have to go to everybody and say, oh, this is the land. If you don't buy land, mine will not increase. But what you see with one coin and all these other CDC and what have you, they are just, uh, and of course, they are taking advantage of the hype of the blockchain. If it does not have a blockchain, that means if it is not governed by cryptography, if it is not governed, it does not have a white paper, it does not have developers, if it's all you're hearing are market, I mean, nobody markets Bitcoin as, um, forget what the media is saying about the price. We got into Bitcoin, actually, you know, people that got into it, got into it purely because of the technology. A lot of people that started using the internet, actually. Yes, later on, you now find out that this thing can do much more, you know, but we got into it because of that technology. That's why blockchain technology can do so much more. One coin and all that, in my mind, in my opinion, I would not advise any of, of your viewers to, you know, to invest in it because they are all Ponzi um, um, schemes. So, buyer beware. Absolutely. All right, so. Taiwo is at it again. <laughs> uh, Taiwo, fantastic. He says it's not been hacked because the source coders are the hackers. They are making their own homework, so to say. I guess that, I mean, that's, that's uh, the comment from Taiwo. Um, then I'm going to ask um, Can I make money? Okay, I think you've answered that. Mining Bitcoin. You have said that um, uh, right. the transaction fee, so to speak. Yeah, but right now it's difficult to. See. Back in the day, 2010, 2011, you could actually mine Bitcoin on a normal computer, but now you need an entire infrastructure. Like saying, can you start your own, like, uh, um, can you start your own Google or can you start your own Amazon? You need the kind of data the, uh, servers you need. Mm. So right now, I would just tell people instead of mining, just buy and, and keep. Good. So, um, there, so, I mean, I'm in Nigeria now. Uh, is there anywhere in Nigeria or probably somewhere in West Africa or Africa where Bitcoin has been accepted for transactions? Um, well, in in a lot of a lot of places you can use Bitcoin. I probably online right now in physical stores. Probably when you go to South Africa, they accept them in all these stores and shops and all that. You know, right now you really can in this part of the world at the moment. But if you now go to the UK and you, I mean, I was in US. Um, you know, uh, last year, and they actually have Bitcoin ATM machines. Like when you go in there and you get Bitcoins off the ATM, or you give them dollars and give you Bitcoin, or give Bitcoin and get dollars, and you walk into stores, buy coffee, buy even shirts, tops, you know, they accept Bitcoin. And just like you see, they accept Visa, Mastercard, they also you see the logo. You know, it's something, I mean, this area is. Is, is, is not going anywhere. I mean, if you go to some school, MIT, they're already looking at, you know, um, their profession, their courses now that they're offering around blockchain, their universities offering MSc degrees, PhD programs in blockchain and cryptocurrency technology. I mean, um, MIT, Harvard, all of them have Bitcoin clubs and a lot of consulting. I mean, it's, it's becoming more mainstream. People are seeing it as not just Bitcoin per se, but the entire infrastructure, you know, the entire blockchain, you know, that's you know that platform. That's 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 uh, what I can say. Good. I think we are getting close to the end of this now. Um, I must say it's been very very insightful for me, you know, um, and I think it's definitely something worth doing further research on and probably testing the waters, but not with your life savings or your exactly. or your pension. Um, especially with the with, with you alluding to the fact that when the internet first came up. A lot of people were kind of fearful of it. Some people felt it would never ever, I mean, writing would never go away and all those things, but it's almost becoming an impossibility. You can't yeah. live without it. Without it. Good. Um, so you've shared your personal experience with, with Bitcoin, um, about your involvement with Bitcoin. Um, we've talked about where, and, uh, where they can be accepted, and you've talked about mostly developed uh, nations. Um, so finally, I'm going to say, what what do you think are the opportunities that are there for people to take advantage of when it comes to Bitcoin and um, using, I mean, taking advantage of the blockchain technology as a whole? Uh, well, I know for blockchain technology, it's not just about financial. I mean, I know it could be used in health registries and stuff like that, you know. Well, I don't want to dwell too much on that because you see any new thing, what I, it is still, I like telling somebody when the internet first came out that oh you can build an entire school on this thing. People will not people have to first get comfortable with building. I mean people had just one page then. 
just have static information. We didn't even have all this dynamic, you know, nobody had video, nobody had, you know. So at the time, we just wanted to make sure that, you know, this platform, that, uh, the, the, the blockchain thing. So I don't tell people about um, land registry, when we're still struggling to use it for financial. Um, so I, I tell people, a lot of people have to first get involved and use it. What I tell people, get, download a Bitcoin wallet, download an Ethereum wallet, download a Litecoin wallet, buy a small fraction, it doesn't matter if it is five pounds or 10 pounds, transact with it, send from one address to the other. Then you now start to see, it's when you use it, that you start to see um, a, lot of, a lot of things that it has to offer. And I, I'm saying this against the backdrop of, you know, anything that is, there's a book called um, there's a book on innovation that talks about disruptive innovation and sustaining innovation. Now, a lot of people are used to sustaining innovation, something that builds on. If I have a new laptop now with big RAM and you know hard disk, it's sustaining the zero. But if I have a means by which we can actually do this thing without the use of a laptop or a phone, maybe through some other means, maybe through our watches, you just press the button and you can be anywhere and we do it. That's disruptive innovation. People are going to question it at first. Send it Uber. When Uber first came, a lot of people were, oh, what's all this thing? Why would I, you know, I'm used to normal taxi. I go to the taxi for Airbnb. Why would I stay in somebody's house? That's the same thing. But until you start to use it, when you start to use it, then you start to see, hmm, maybe this thing can disrupt some aspect of financial system. Maybe it's something that if we look critically at, but if you can't do that if you're not a user. If you're just sitting and reading all the media hype, and reading, you know, you're not making the decision on the basis of your own understanding of that technology. So I'll tell people, even if it's one pound of Bitcoin, you can just buy and, you know, use it. See, you know, where you can come in, see how you can offer services. A lot of people are already using, you know, Bitcoin for cross-border payment. I mean, you're in Nigeria today, if you need to send money this evening and everywhere is closed, BBCs are closed and all that, but you need, if you have Bitcoin, get the other person to get the Bitcoin wallet to transact. The, the person receives it within 10 minutes, cashes out on an exchange, the person has, you know, pounds. So you, but you now begin to see, wow, so we can do this, we can do that, we can do this. And only then can we now start to look at how to use it for, you know, land registry, how to use it for um, identification, how to even use it for voting. Blockchain can be you can sit in your house and use it for the for for the 2019 you know election and you will see the result. I mean, every time you have to centralize something, things like INEC, you have to depend on INEC to give you the exact result. They can't be compromised. So blockchain has come to sort all that man in the middle, you know, problem out. So if you take out any uh, if you take out anything that can be decentralized, that can be disintermediated. You know, can be taken out. That means you can now come. Uh, you can have supplier. Uh, you can make supplier the buyer. You know, you can you can physically meet and transact without you know a middleman. You know, so you are taking out. And every time you know there's a middleman, there is a cost that goes on. Which is why every time you do cross border transfer, you see that bank A will take the bank, corresponding bank will take the cost. So by the time you are transferring one thousand pounds, the person receiving it will probably be receiving like nine hundred and something pounds. That money has. You know, and eventually, you know, disappeared. You know, in, 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 in charges and what have you. Fantastic. Now let's try not to go beyond the one hour mark. We're almost there now. Now, Taiwo has asked, um, can Bitcoin really replace fiscal cash? I think you've talked about it in terms of it. We complement it, and then even in some instances, probably be a substitute for it. Um, so, what, what will be your final word as we in closing? Yeah, I would just tell, especially the you know millennials, if you're under. 40, 45, I think it's something you should be looking at. And you see, by virtue of the work I do as well, we advise, um, you know, central banks and banks. So and you do want to talk about your, I mean, your company? Okay. Well, 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 Digital Info these days is my company. We are purely cyber security, governance, risk and compliance company. Now we, we're trying to get into the whole blockchain, you know, um, aspect of it. What we tell people and what we advise people is, number one, um, don't... Um, you know, over-regulation sometimes is a drain on some on prosperity. You know, this is, because a lot of people don't understand something, so they tend to want to regulate it out of existence. Now, you cannot regulate a piece of technology that has come to it. So the same way, no matter, even in China, as, as big as they are, they, they, they cannot unplug themselves from the internet. Yes, they can, you know, 
stop you from going to Google and YouTube and all that, but they created their own. So you cannot really regulate the technology. What you can regulate are uh, you can regulate the players that are that want to play in that segment. Just like we have um, internet, you can't regulate the internet, but you can regulate the ISPs. So you can give them, you know, so that in case, for instance, you pay for one meg and your ISP is giving you 500 kilo, kilobits per second, you have a report, the NTC to go to and report. You are regulating the player. You are not regulating the technology. Now, regulating the technology, you make whatever you want to do on the internet, you can, you can bring up a, a website today and all you are talking about is that there is nothing that will stop you. Nobody is going to come and say, no, don't do it. Morals are different from ethics. So the same way with cryptocurrency, yes, they're going to have scams. They're going to have people losing money. They're going to have, but you can now not say because, oh, Bitcoin is, then we should, we should outlaw it or something. I always tell even the regulators to, to look at it critically and, you know, just watch for now and see how it evolves. You know, you don't want to be at the end of the day. It's, it's, I think just like the mobile phones came to change the way Africans do business, cryptocurrency and blockchain any country within this africa sub-saharan africa you know that gets on board is going to really you know change you know the lifestyle of people because financial inclusion we can do that um, um get people that don't have the underbanked you know can run the bank and you know um you know the uh, people that are in uh, in a in a in a village uh, can get people you know, we call the on the south on the south yeah Okay, thank you very much. I really appreciate this uh, time. Thank One you. of the things I've learned, and maybe I'm not putting it the way you want to put it, is when it comes to Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, you want to first and foremost be a user before you attempt to be an investor. I mean, that's not the way you put it, but at least use it first at the rudimentary level. Then you can now begin to think of you want to take it up as um, something of risk, you know, with attendance rewards. So to speak. Um, so thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Chey is a cyber security expert, um, a cryptocurrency uh, enthusiast. Um, he um, runs with with his partner Wale um, Digital Encode, and is the foremost cyber security firm actually in Africa. And he goes beyond Africa to the won so many awards. I know Georgia and a lot of other places. Um, I always refer to himself and Wale. You know, it may look like uh, maybe flattery, but that's not the case. You know, as the Mark, you know, Zuckerberg and um, is it Eduardo? I mean, the, the other guy who started. The new idea. <laughs> yeah, well, they started from somewhere. Too. somewhere well, yeah. That's, so that's, I'm speaking to the future now. You know, so I do not take you guys for granted, and I'm sure the sky the limit. And I'm sure also uh, my viewers, um, and those who have joined in, at, and, and those who will also watch this um, streaming again or the video again will find it useful and helpful in terms of laying the foundation when it comes to bitcoins and i hope that it's been all things bitcoins as we promised thank you very much for joining have a great day and um, see you sometime soon thank you bye bye